to the stars lead to Red Square. For the peoples of the world, Moscow has become the mecca of communism and the cosmos. Yuri Gagarin was first to blaze the trail in space. He swung from an orbit in the sky to an orbit of peace and friendship. Endless are the roads travelled by this son of the earth who has become the son of the sky. Everybody wants to see the space hero. The second was German Titon. He spent more than 24 hours in space and when he came back to earth, The welcomes he was given by nations, lands and continents were endless. The astronaut shares his thoughts about the peaceful universe outside the Earth and of the peace for the Earth. The legion of space heroes grew. It was joined by Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich. Their story is told by our film, Star Brother. The research institutes and organizations which participated in launching the orbital spaceships Vostok 3 and Vostok 4 helped to make this film. Scenario by Yevgeny Ryabchikov. Direction by Dmitry Bogolyepov. Photography directed by Dmitry Gazduk and Igor Kasatkin. Music by Vladimir Rubin. Sound recorded by Alexei Kulakov. Incorporated are pictures taken in space by Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich, both pilot astronauts of the USSR. A Moscow popular science film studio production. Once upon a time, that was how the fairy tales and legends used to begin. So, once upon a time is the way we shall begin our fairy tale and true story of Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich. They are ordinary people, like all of us. They have ordinary joys, walk among us, eat and drink like every one of us does. And if we didn't know them, nobody would ever have the slightest idea that they are the real heroes of fairy tale and legend. set themselves the new task of investigating the effects of space, especially of weightlessness, on the human being when on a group flight of several days. The men to go up were Andrian Nikolaev, a Communist Party member and airman from Tuvasia. Yuri Gagarin and German Titov, who had already been in space, gave him friendly advice on how to prepare for this unprecedented voyage. Nikolaev's twin is Pavel Popovich, also a Communist Party member and airman but from the Ukraine. They are fully resolved to carry out the extremely complicated flight assignment and provide science with invaluable information about the life and work of two spacemen at one and the same time. A man can do anything, provided he has the knowledge and equipment. Space techniques are learned at classes. Without knowledge, one cannot smelt steel or blaze new trails, especially in space. The astronaut is the incarnation of a well-developed intellect and moral integrity.
To build up a healthy body, the astronaut finds every kind of sport useful. After skiing, comes ice hockey, a fast-moving game. To cut a long story short, the astronaut must excel in weightlifting, in track and field events, in swimming, in gymnastics, and even in tightrope walking. At the Space Center, everything, classes, training, and recreation follows a definite timetable. The only thing the timetable does not provide for is a few short rendezvous. It is winter, but in this laboratory, it is as hot as in the tropics. For Paro Popovich, this place is as warm as the equator. In the thermal chamber, the mercury is already above 70 degrees centigrade. The spaceman is acclimatized to high temperatures and is conditioned to be prepared for any contingency that may develop in a real flight. The mercury rises another two degrees. astronaut must have increased vestibular resistance. Along with the other senses, the vestibular apparatus, which is the organ of equilibrium or balance and spatial orientation, has become very important for long space flight. When you are on these swings for a long time and turn your head into the bargain, the stimular resistance is greatly increased. But there are certain visual irritants that turn you dizzy. To overcome that, one must go through special training. One must stick on a swinging seat when the colored stripes of a rotating wall whirl, blink, and alternate around you. And you must not let your eyes stray from one fixed point. Little by little, the training given to increase the vestibular resistance grows more and more complicated. The rotor reproduces the most unusual situations that may be encountered during a space flight. Things like this happen neither in the air, on the sea, or all the more so on dry land. But in space, even this can happen. Thanks to special training, the astronauts have increased the civil resistance to such an extent that they are well able to withstand the spinning even on the rotor. It was Tsiolkovsky who gave us the rocket, the only thing that can break out of the clutches of terrestrial gravitation and take us to other worlds. The first stepping stone to the universe was these Lilliputs, the first Soviet rocket. How terrifically large must be the rocket which boosted into the depths of the universe these man-made celestial objects. Rockets had already been sent off to the moon and the sun, but 
were still unfit to carry a man. For manned space flight, a house in space was required. And it was in cabins like these that Yuri Gagarin and German Titov set off for the stars. But to be absolutely safe, a second cabin is needed. This is the space suit. All space accoutrements are carefully tested and checked. In the first place, the space suit is tested in a pressure chamber, which simulates elevation to tremendous altitude. It is here that the test man finds out whether the space suit will be able in case of a mishap in the spaceship cabin, to protect the astronaut from oxygen hunger and instantaneous pressure fluctuation. The space suit is really, in its way, a minute flat with all the conveniences, ventilation, electric light, radio, heating, and even sewerage. They are the very first to try out everything that is to serve man out in space. This is the gas chamber. Even a molecule of gas must not get through the space tube. While this is the low temperature chamber, the frost that will strike may be encountered only at the pole of cold in the icy wastes of the Antarctic. The space suit is also tried out in a special pool. You'll see a man shot out of a gun only at a circus or perhaps read of it in science fiction. But today, a man can be shut out of a spaceship cabin should the astronaut catapult out upon his return from his trip to the star. The space suit is quite a sturdy thing. In it, one may dive without fear into the ocean deep and there quickly shed the suspension arrangement. Now for the centrifuge. Evolving faster and faster, the centrifuge simulates the takeoff and return overload. Then it spins faster and faster. The overloads increase. They are already much larger than those that the astronaut may encounter. pushes the head into the shoulders, pins the body to the seat, and seems to fill the eyelids with lead. The face is so greatly distorted as to be unrecognizable. But the deaf man does his duty. He will supply the astronaut with a stellar armor that is super sturdy. What about the astronauts themselves? It is not the first time that Marina has seen off her husband. He may disappear for a fortnight, or even more, even though he's almost next door. He disappears into the silence chamber. the doctors investigate the human being's psychological endurance and see how quietness and isolation affect his attention, memory, thinking and feeling. Quietness is a medicine, but like any medicine, in large doses it is harmful. Every day another shift of doctors takes over. The 
the astronaut conducts himself here as he always does, sticking to his ordinary habit. psychologically well-trained man can take it. Now it is Andrian's turn in the silence chamber. And in a fortnight, when he also grew accustomed to the quietness, imperturbable he is. The astronaut has to expect a state of weightlessness up in space. On Earth, we have nothing like it. People know nothing about it. So to train for it, weightlessness is stimulated on aircraft. The cabin is weightless, the man is weightless, everything is weightless. Again, the pilot takes the plane along a fast parabolic curve. Again, weightlessness sets in. The astronaut must learn how to drink. In this condition, water loses its usual form, breaking up into little globules. He will also have to learn how to write when in a state of weightlessness. And to learn how to take pictures with his camera. At last, the time comes to rehearse the whole of the space flight, from takeoff to landing. Here he is in the cabin of a mock spaceship, which simulates all the conditions of a real space flight. This is the control desk. The command is given. And the astronaut orbits and takes his bearings by the globe. Everything is as it is during a real flight. Entries are made in the logbook day after day. The astronaut opens the optical viewing device and lo, the cosmos appears before him. He takes pictures of it with his film camera. response to a given command, he switches to manual control. One has the full illusion of a space flight. There is the Earth, down below. It's a 
special projection unit that does the trick. On the road to the stars, anything might happen. First of all, it is fortitude and a level head that are needed. However, one must react with split-second rapidity and be most accurate. Put down the visor. Put on gloves. a short while ago that German Titov himself sat here. Now, he passes the relay to Andrian Nikolaev. How useful the astronaut will find his friend's advice and help on his distant voyage. are trained to fly to the star, but they're also taught to return. The astronaut may land without emerging from the spaceship cabin or by the catapulting out and dropping down by parachute. Naturally, the astronaut must also excel in parachute jumping. And so training goes on in the daytime and at night, and the astronaut makes one jump after another onto dry ground and to water. There he goes. Povich is always gay and cheerful. Never say die. It may very well happen that he will return from outer space in this fashion. So he must also be able to parachute down on water as well. The new sciences of space medicine and space biology are tackling the task of preparing man for long flights in the cosmos. Scientists observe the astronauts month after month. The latest types of instruments pencil curves on hundreds of miles of tape to describe the physiological and psychological condition of the astronaut. By making a careful study of all these curves, the scientists conclude that both Andrian Nikolaev and Pavel Popovich may be recommended for this unusual journey to the star. Yes, the astronauts are ready to take off. But before they do that, they get a holiday. They do come to Moscow, and here they are on the Lenin Hill. Pavel Popovich shows his little daughter his favorite horse. Here, the astronauts hold near to heart everything. For them, this is a world, their world, of music, lyrics, painting. Natasha has her own favorite spot. That's the zoo. And about the zoo, she has little of poem of her own to recite. Daddy and Anki Andrew at a bear with me do look. And later on they make a present to me of a very nice book. Every dad will stop to give his kid a pony ride. And since Pavel Popovich has a very soft spot in his heart for his little girl, on this day of farewell to Moscow, he wants to show her everything. A good 
idea is to board the huge Ferris wheel and go up with all the family to get a delightful view of Moscow. But if the man's a bachelor, he finds himself together with an unknown myth. We wonder what she will have to say about her neighbor now. This is something the airman simply can't miss. Don't be scared. We'll buckle you on tighter, comes an assuring voice. Quite a familiar stunt in aerobatics, only a bit too close to the ground. Sasha could see her daddy and Uncle Andrianne up in the sky. Happy landing. Here's hoping the landing from space will be just as happy. Popovich and his family have gone up. Sasha wants to know whether Daddy is frightened. Well, I do feel a wee bit afraid, Pavel Popovich returns with a grin. Natasha is delighted beyond measure. Meanwhile, for Daddy and Uncle Andrew, the time has come to bid goodbye to Moscow, to home, and to Mother Earth. They look quite calm, but no doubt deep down inside they say, goodbye banks and bridges, until we see again the palaces and towers of the Holy Kremlin. The last thing now is to join this interminable stream of people and enter the mausoleum with all who yearn to see Lenin. The astronauts have made it a rule to come to Red Square to Lenin's tomb before they take off. The ever-living Lenin was always with us. He was with us in those distant years when the young Soviet Republic was just born. He was with us during the grim time of the treacherous Nazi invasion, a time when the entire people, young and old, rallied to Lenin's banner to defend their happiness, both when we are engaged in mortal combat with the enemy and when we are forging the great victory, Lenin is always with us in what we do and in what we think in all of our life. was to you, Lenin, that the astronauts, your star children, come. The new socialist society is tackling grand tasks and it is rearing grand heroes to accomplish them. has passed since the day German Titov bid farewell to the space center before leaving for the takeoff. And again we witness here the scene of party. Only now two are going. She's an aviatrix and she knows that she must keep a cool head. However, her heart goes pit apart, and tears involuntarily spring. Mm -hmm. 
Happy journey, Falcon. Happy journey, Eagle. Now we shall wait. We shall wait as the deep heavens wait the coming of the heroes. 